What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Tribe of Millionaires podcast from GoBundance. It's uh, it's exciting to be here in Park City, Utah for the 10th annual Winter Mastermind. Uh, we're, we're doing live interviews with guests, speakers, you name it. There'll be a ton of content coming out for that. And I've got a guy right now that's going to be speaking tonight at the event. He is the founder of CEO Coaching International. He is a speaker, obviously, if he's speaking tonight, best-selling author of Make Big Happen, and now has written another book called Making Big Happen. Mark Moses, welcome, my friend. Jamie, good to be with you. Took uh, about 20 minutes of audio video work to get here, but we're here. We're here, live, <laughs> live from Park City. That's all that matters, live from Park City. No, gra- glad, to, glad to have you here. And you're, uh, I know, off to sunnier pastures tomorrow, so we'll, uh, we'll get you in and out of this interview and get you, on the, get you on the flight to Cabo. Let's talk a little about your backstory. So we started to talk a little bit about where you're from and uh, first language, really interesting, but just give me a little bit of a, a backstory on you, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So I grew up in uh, Sudbury, which is uh, a little mining town, 250 miles north of Toronto. Like It is cold yeah. in winter, like seven, eight months a year. Neighbor to Santa Claus, all that stuff. Yeah, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. yeah, reindeer going by. So when I uh, graduated from college, um, I uh, packed up a U-Haul and drove um, to California. Mm. And um, I, was spent, I spent 32 years in California before moving to Miami two and a half years ago. So um, I'm happy to be living in uh, the uh, closest country to uh, South America or co- closest country to the United States, uh, yeah. Miami, which yeah. is like living in South America, <laughs> as you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the cold outside is not befitting a man y- that y- lives in Miami. Sí, que bueno que español es que ahí en Miami es perfecto. Exactly what he said. Ex- whatever he just said. Exactly yeah. what he Thank said. Thank you. What brought you to California? I just wanted, I, I, well, the truth of the matter is, uh, I watched when I was in college, Fast Times at Ridgemount High, sure. and I got, I got so inspired, like, um, warm weather, beaches, pretty women, yeah. and I just, just was inspired when I graduated uh, to move somewhere warm, get out of the cold, and and just pursue something different. So I love it. I love it. Thirty-two years there, and then real quick, the transition to Miami. What was that for? Yeah, I, I think that I would call that empty nester syndrome. Gotcha. And um, uh, taxes. I was about to. I, I was waiting for the taxes part. Oh, yeah, sure. Every, <laughs> everybody is right. So I'm a California refugee, as I'm known. There you go. To Miami, not Texas, though. That's for another time. Most Californians go to Texas. It's it's written somewhere in the Constitution. I, I think. think. Although there's a few now migrating over there to Miami. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. It's a beautiful place that you're in. So tell me a little bit about about uh, you know what you do. Coaching International, CEO Coaching International, make big happen. What's the story there? What do you, what, what's the what's the impetus? How did you develop this brand and this this coaching platform? So it started 14 years ago. I was speaking at a conference, and a guy named Joe from Omaha walked up to me and said, "Hey, hey, man, will you be my coach?" I said, "I don't know, Joe." Um, and he talked me into it, and I said, "Maybe we'll do this just for a few months." And uh, I had sold my business a couple years earlier. I had a mortgage business. Cool. Um, and um, I sold it in 2006, just before the mortgage and uh, global credit crisis. And um, so Joe was my first client. And then somebody else reached out, and, and, and then another guy reached out. And before I knew it, I had 33 clients on my own. And then um, today, we fast forward, we have uh, 441 live clients today in about 50 countries around the world in approximately 55 different industries. Our coaches are the former, uh, it's just world-class, former CEOs of Procter & Gamble, Samsung, Goodyear, Home Depot, Under Armour, Xerox, Tektronix, Kohler, Mercedes-Benz. It is like an amazing, I'm, I'm glad I got here first. I wouldn't get hired here today, yeah. but it's amazing. They, former world-class CEOs that have now retired, they're typically between 50 and their early 60s, and they help our clients execute on what they want so we train them from being a former world-class ceo to being a world-class coach i love that that's amazing go back to the mortgage company for a moment for me if you would you sold that in 06 first question that jumps to mind is did you have foresight was there a reason you sold prior to 08 could you see it coming or was it more good timing yeah so i would tell you that it was lucky timing i'm luckier than good yet i went through the um i went I went broke in 1998 when Wall Street pulled out of our product and I suffered for two years and I went all the way to 
like literally filling out my bankruptcy schedules, bankruptcy schedules, and was going to file on October 13, 2000 until an angel investor wrote us a check that morning that saved the company. And then we went on to build this $1.6 billion uh, mortgage company, which I sold um, October 13th in 2006. So I'll tell you, in August, I went for a 100-mile bike ride. And I, before I went out that morning, I read a story on Bear Stearns about the tightening of credit that we'd experienced back in 98. Mm -hmm. And I said to my wife, I'm just not feeling good about this again. I still had scars from being broke back in 98. And this is, man, it wasn't that long ago that and we finally recovered and we're doing amazing. And uh, it caused me to um, move to sell the business. We could feel it come in. One day my head of credit walked into my office and said, hey, do you want to do this loan? And I said, man, I've never looked at a loan my whole life. I'm just the owner, CEO. He said, hey, man, do you want to do the loan? I said, man, that's your call. Why are you asking me? And with such firmness. Mm. So if you don't do the loan, your top salesperson's going to quit. I said, why are they going to quit? Because everybody else will do the loan. Would well, you want to do the loan? No. Mm. That's not really much of a house. Right. And But it, it was a drug that it, it was just all about Wall Street was the drug dealers <laughs> and the mortgage people like us were the drug users, and they they got us hooked on their drug back then, and it made me nervous, and I chose to exit. Smart. And I'm glad I did. Yeah, of course. No, yeah, but you built, you made something big in the meantime. From '98 to to 2006, you grew up a significant company. What was you, angel investors? Such a, an appropriate term in that in that moment. What what changed? You went from a product that's uh, uh, you know was pulled and almost bankrupted you to an angel investor comes in and then boom, one point six billion. Like what changed for you in that in that moment in that in the the structure of your business? Like what did you do to go from almost out of business for a product being pulled to now building the significant? Well, it was reinventing ourselves. What part of the mortgage business were we going to play in in that time? And we had to make the decision, and we completely changed. The, the product that we were in no longer existed, so we had to morph our business into what did exist. And we created something like a – it was like a franchise program where we were rolling up mortgage brokers across the country. We ended up having 65 uh, offices across the U.S. Wow. of people that we had rolled up. And because we were mortgage bankers, we could share some of the profits that we made on the banking side – back with them and that would create a real win-win for us and for them wow what are some of the keys that you learned in this re-identifying of yourself and your brand and all of what you just built what are some of the keys that you learned in making big or when the first time you made big happen i don't want to go to making big yet you made big happen first what are some of the key elements of making big happen for you yeah it's it's first the um desire uh, to reinvent yourself it's hard when you got to reinvent yourself. That's a component of what you teach then. Like that element of reinventing yourself is a big part of it. I yeah, guess. it can happen to anybody. Like sure. products can disappear. A, a, a line of work can become or a industry can become unpopular. Yeah. And you need to just figure out how to pivot. Even like just take this whole work from home thing that just came across the whole world when COVID began. Many businesses had to pivot. In a lot of cases, you couldn't get product from overseas, yeah. so you had no sales. You just had to figure supply chain issues or whatever it was. You needed to learn how to figure out, how am I going to survive in this new environment that I'm living today? Secondly, it's um, figure out what is success for me a year from now? What's success for a year three, three years from now? And what is the one thing that I can keep score on? a specific and measurable activity, something I can do that if I do X, I get Y um, to drive the outcome that I want. And I'll give you an example. Yeah, please. One, one client of mine says to me one day, I want to do $70 million in new business this year. I said, terrific. What's the number one specific measurable activity you will keep score on to drive that outcome? He says, prospect meetings. I said, well, great. How many? He says, 400. So you do 400 prospect meetings? You'll get 70 million. He goes, I'll get at least 70 million. Well, let me look for the root activity then. How are you going to get 400 prospect meetings? He says, 2,000 people come to my seminars and come and listen to my pitch, and I'll convert about 20% of those to prospects, and then I'll close about $70 million. I said, okay. Well, I got one question left. How are we going to get 
2,000 people to come and listen to you. You're handsome and all that, but not that handsome. And, um, and you're a good speaker, but right, right. I don't know if you're that good. Yeah. He said 21,000 phone calls to engineering firms in Kansas City. I went, are there that many? I was and there's all, all that stuff. And <laughs> so that year, he made the 21, th- not him, but he had three people sure. making 21,000 phone calls into engineering firms in Kansas City. And that year delivered $84 million in new business. So the crux wow. of what we teach at CEO Coaching is get clarity on what you want and the specific and measurable activities you will keep score on every day, every week, every month, every quarter that will drive that outcome that you really want. So clarity what you want and clarity of the activities and keep score on it. Hold yourself accountable to the activity because if you do X, you will get Y. No doubt. That's incredible. I love the I love the kind of the, the, the root cause analysis. You're going down deeper, level, deeper, level. Because we, often we do. We set these big goals and then, you know, we kind of dream on them. We don't really get to the, to the point of uh, uh, what is the metric or the, the lead indicator to get the lag, right? It, absolutely. I'll give you an example. It even applies to a sport. Yeah. So I've done 12 Ironman, uh, full distance Ironman. Uh, That's it? Try, yeah, just, just, yeah. Oy vey. <laughs> so um, listen, uh, so doing 12 hours in the Ironman is yeah. kind of the, that number that if you do an Ironman 12 hours, that's, that's pretty studly. Yeah. And uh, at one point I said to my coach, I said, I'd like to do an Ironman in sub 11. And that now you're moving into more elite status. Mm. Uh, that's, that's, you do an under 11, you're a good athlete. You're a great athlete, right? And uh, so we just figured out what are the specific and measurable activities I can train on that if I do X, I will get Y. I finished uh, the Ironman uh, in 10 hours, 56 minutes, which goes to show that, um, like I like to say, if you can't define it, you can't measure it. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So that can apply either to business or to sport or anything in life that of anything that you really want. That's amazing. And congrats, by the way. That's incredible. Thank That's you. A, a, Thank a, you. Unbelievable. I don't know the Iron Man well enough, but I know well enough that 12 hours is, in, is insane. Well, let me tell you. And me, 11 sub? That's in, that's unbelievable. Go ahead. Let me tell you. You swim 2.4 miles, yeah. and then you ride your bike 112 miles. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like, think about that. If you went out in the car right now and said, I got I got to go, I'm, I'm going to dinner. It's 112 yeah. miles away. And then you got to run a full distance <laughs> marathon at yeah. 26.2 miles. Yeah. You know, no stopping for lunch or a hug or, well, maybe you can stop for a hug. But, Quick one. Um, and, and you carry on. It's you're a just, long you're, day. You're booking, though, at 11 hours and 50, or uh, 10 hours and 56 minutes. That's incredible. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Um, big. So the idea of setting big goals, BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goals and all of that. I think I know the answer to this from what you were talking about. But what is your guidance on that? Like when people think about setting a big goal, is it always the question, is that big enough? Like you hear that, right? Like, oh, you set a goal, but... Is that big enough for you? Like, how do you guide people on the idea of setting a big goal? Is it simply how how can it be attained, or or even in that space, are people limited in their thinking of what they can do, the amount of work that calling twenty one thousand firms, that sort of thing in Kansas City? Of all, that's the weirdest. I've never twenty one thousand engineering firms in one city. Anyway, twenty one thousand employees at engineering firms in one. Oh, city. okay. I thought it was yep. a firm. I was like, holy crap! But yep. that makes more sense. Yep. But give me a, can you define big and how do you coach on big? Because I, I struggle with this. How big a goal should I be setting? Am I undercutting myself or am I dreaming? Are you coming to the keynote tonight? I am. You're going to love it because, look, I'm, as you probably saw, I'm not very tall, right? So, too. But, right? <laughs> so my favorite word is big. And it's really determining what big means to you. So let me just polarize an example. So let's say you're a uh, – you're – 10 million in uh, in revenue in your business. Yeah. And and I say to you, how about we try the concept of zero? And you go, well, what do you mean by concept of zero? Mm. I said add zero to the end of it and instead of 10 million it's 100 million, okay? So that's exponential big thinking. So you go, oh man, I never thought to I thought maybe 15, maybe 20, maybe, you know, 30 years from now, maybe I can do 30 million. Right. But if you think about what would it take or could it take to do 100 million and then begin working the plan backwards? You'll find that 
it's achievable. I'm going to tell a story tonight about a guy um, that I met 11 years ago that I started coaching. He was 80 million at 80 million revenue, pretty sure. decent sized firm. And he announced to his company that he was going to do $1 billion in 10 years. Like that, it's like, man, that takes some serious grit in and to be thinking that big. And it's even a little bit bigger than the concept is zero. Anyway, he achieved that goal five years early. And uh, I think we are limited by how big we can think or people th telling us that we can't achieve it, or I can't hire that person because why would they come and work with my firm, my little lemonade sure. stand? Yeah. And But if you can think it and dream it, it can happen. And I believe that you can achieve anything that you want if you believe in yourself. Where do you get this mindset from? Where did, where did you develop this? Was it simply... The fact that you scaled your business, did you create evidence in the time that you scaled your business to $1.6 billion, or did that belief come when you did that reinvention in 98, 99? When that I, I think it's been a culmination o over the years. So I played competitive tennis when I was in uh, high school. My, my mom was tough, right? It was Everything was about playing to win. I, you know, I, my brothers and I played piano, and we competed at the music festival at yeah. piano, and we always win because, won because it was what my mom required. When I went to college, I um, I tried out for the squash team, and I got cut. And uh, I was I was upset that I got cut. And then, 1992, I win the U.S. squash championship, and it's yeah, it was exciting to call the coach back up and say, "Hey, dude, uh, you know who you just cut? Uh, the U.S. Uh, squash champion." And yeah. and so it's when you fight through adversity. It's you learn. You can roll over or learn to fight. Mm -hmm. And when my when my dad went bankrupt in, uh, I, I haven't shared this with you. My dad went bankrupt in my last year of high school, and he gave me a thousand bucks and said, "Hey, look, it's all I got. And I know you're going to college, and you can choose to go. I hope you go, but that's all I got. Figure out how to get some grants or some loans and make it on your own. And then." I, it wasn't enough to pay for college. I got some grants and loans. And then when I was 19, I started my own business while I was in college. And actually, in the first summer that I did this, um, I had a little student painter business. I made, uh, I did 70000 in revenue and made $18,000. Wow. And then I got inspired and I said, oh, my God. I did it again this next summer when I was 20 years old. I did 120000 in business and made $35,000. Like, Oh my God, if I work hard, even at something that I don't know, sure. it's amazing what I could achieve. And that applied to squash, it applied to the Ironman, it, anything that I've done, you know, I've done the North Pole Marathon, South Pole Marathon, Great Wall Marathon, anything, I'm up for anything, right? And I, like I believe that if you want it, if you want it bad enough, you can go get it. It's, up, it, it's all in your head. It's up to you. Do you want to do you want to grit through that? And so is it, people ask me all the time, all right, Mark, is it skill or is it will? When, when, what do you think, Jamie? I believe it's will. You're absolutely right. I, I, so. I, I, I believe really, listen, that like, the, many of us aren't that smart, right? But we can work hard if we have the will. You have the will to figure it out the will to not give up, the will to learn what you have to, the will to hire great people and inspire them. And that will, it's amazing what one can achieve. Yeah, I, we talked to, well, Chris Waddell, who spoke last night. We had him on, uh, a few other uh, uh, you know, major league and, and NBA type players, like, you know, uh, athletes on, and that's always the key, right? The skill is, the, the skill is, you look at like a minor leaguer to a major leaguer or an NBA D league or G league, whatever it is to an NBA player. The skill gap is not that big a, a difference. It's the will. It's how willing are you to put in the extra time, put in the extra reps, whatever it might be to get yourself to that level. You know, Michael Jordan it was skillful, of course, but was he any more skillful than other guys? Yeah, maybe not, but his will. Tom Brady, we talked about him a moment ago. Tom Brady's ridiculous with, he's not even that physically gifted. He doesn't even have that much skill, but his will supersedes that. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. And I would take will over skill yeah. all day long. Makes sense. I want to be respectful of your time. I know you got to prep for this keynote tonight and everything. Give me, uh, give me a, a, an idea of, of the book, Making Big Happen. You wrote Make Big Happen. Now it's Making Big Happen. What do you hope 
readers take from this new version of the book? So where it came from, people would come up to me, uh, to me and my partners, and they would say, why is it and how is it you have such a, an amazing growth rate? Our average client grows revenue at twice the national average as compared to NYU Stern and grows profit at three times the national average. We've had over 30 exits of companies selling their business at over a hundred million to a billion and four over a billion. And then, so we wrote a book on how, what are the practices, what are the frameworks that they use to be able to execute? And what I'm going to talk about tonight is the, these practices that really boil down to, uh, there are seven business rhythms, the four make big happen questions. What do you want? How do you get what you want? What's going to stand in the way? And how do you hold yourself accountable to get what you want? And then 30 tools um, that any business leader can use to, hey, I, I want to figure out how to do this. And you can just grab a, one of the tools in our workbook within the book to help you figure out how to do that. Or, or you could hire a mentor or coach to help guide you through how do I do this and how how do I figure out how to make this happen in my business? It's interesting. I, the one question I would have asked, but again, in the interest of time, was going to be around accountability, circumstances for accountability to keep people driving forward toward whatever they say, that big goal that scares them. Like how do they remain accountable to that, the best practices, but I'll learn that tonight, it sounds like, which is great. Um, uh, the other part, real quick, I just wanted to uh, uh, mention to you or affirm you on, I, I love that with with all of the results that you just shared for your client base, the the, the exits, and that you've you've categorized, categorized or uh, catalyzed, catalyzed, whatever the word is, catalyzed, it's good. Um, you also have built a significant culture if you're attracting the kind of talent you are to coach these people, the, the former CEOs of these major major corporations. So kudos to you. I just wanted to honor you on that, real. Quick. Yeah, thank you. It's really um, I'm inspired by. We just had an event this past weekend, so they were all in town. And I'm always humbled by the talent of the people and creating, it, we have a cool, com very cool community of clients, but we also have a really cool community of these former CEOs that are in their 50s and early 60s. They're not dead and they want to do something that's meaningful and purposeful and they get to do that. They don't got to do it. Right. They get to do this. And I just feel inspired being around them. We all learn from each other, too. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Mark, where can people learn more about you, the book, whatever you want to share? Well, they can learn about um, us at uh, CEOcoachinginternational.com. They can find the book Make Big Happen or Making Big Happen on uh, Amazon. It's available there. If you want to do Audible, you want to Kindle or hard, old school hardback, you can do that, uh, yeah. um, too. And I'll, I'll say to, to your listeners, um, as we close, I'll say the following, that I believe there are three kinds of people. Those that make big happen, those that let things happen, and those that ask, what happened? I love it. I appreciate you being here, man. Yeah, thanks. Thank I enjoyed you. our time together. Absolutely. Thanks. <laughs>